passwords for users at that location. So in the event that domain controller is compromised, which is a big concern for a lot of companies, with 2008, that domain controller only stores the passwords for the people at that location. So my 20,000 user company, that domain controller when it's compromised, has only got the passwords for the 50 people at that location. The other great thing we can do is if that read-only domain controller is stolen, we can just delete that domain controller from Active Directory and the AD is smart enough to know which accounts were cached in that security database and automatically reset all those passwords. So even though those passwords are now compromised, they've all been reset and are now useless. Another cool thing we can do is fine-grained password policies. So again, Windows Server 2003, we can only have one security policy for the entire domain. With Server 2008, we can now set multiple security policies and based on a group membership, I can have different policies. So for example, all my executives, I, they may want basic passwords um, matching a certain criteria, four characters, basic. I may have service accounts that I want to have 12 characters complex passwords. So I can now do that in 2008 before I'd need separate domains, which is obviously a nightmare to maintain. We have improved auditing. We can take snapshots of Active Directory, which is really just a point in time copy of the Active Directory. And then I can mount that copy of the Active Directory to look, say, well, was this user account there three days ago and what were its attributes? Trying to do that in 2003, I'd have to create a domain controller, boot into a special directory services with store mode. There's a lot of work involved. With 2008, I can just mount that snapshot in Active Directory and access it via LDAP, look around, see what's there, really helps the whole backup and recovery story. And AD is now just a service that I can stop and restart without having to reboot the box to make any changes. So 2008, as a platform, gave us some very, very useful Active Directory changes. 2008 R2 built on that even further. So now with Active Directory in R2, we now have full PowerShell commandlets. Obviously, PowerShell is the direction we're going for managing Windows Server. And we didn't have any commandlets to manage Active Directory. Well, now in 2008 R2, we have full, we can do every single thing we want to do in Active Directory via the PowerShell now. We have a new administrative console. So for those who actually use Active Directory, especially obviously customers, there's a lot of different tools we have to use today. AD users and computers, sites and services, domains and trust. There's, there's tons of different tools. The Active Directory Administrator console is Microsoft's new vision on how they want to manage the Active Directory. It's a far more streamlined console that's going to bring everything together. Today, it just replaces AD users and computers mainly, but it's very, very intuitive. It makes it very easy to access and manage the Active Directory. We have a web services layer for Active Directory now, which is really putting Active Directory cloud ready. So it's going to be easy for applications to now hook into the Active Directory and use as that cloud-based directory service. We have a recycle bin. So this is basically like the same as the file system. Now if we del delete objects in Active Directory, they go into this uh, is deleted state and I can actually undelete Active Directory objects, users, computers, groups, any object. And there's really not much effort involved and there's no loss of attributes, no loss of data to those objects. So that's one of the big features everyone's excited about, the recycle bin. But the next one is actually, once customers understand what it is, this is a huge saver. So manage service accounts. If you imagine today that I have a large organization and I have lots of different Windows servers running that all run services that have Active Directory accounts. Well, each of those accounts has to have a password if it requires domain access. And what happens a lot of the time is because administrators just don't have the time to reset those passwords, these service accounts, which are typically very powerful, are either shared between multiple services, which is a security risk, or their passwords never change. They're just set to never expire. Well, that's a big security issue, and that's a, a big auditing issue. With 2008 R2, we can create managed service accounts. And all these do is we link a, an account, a service account, to a particular service running on a Windows server, and it automatically updates the password based on our policy and updates Active Directory and the service. 
So there's really now no manual effort involved. Once we create that managed service account and link it to a service, we never touch it again. But it has a complex password, it's updated frequently, but it's zero effort to us. Um, there's new offline domain join capabilities, um, which is really useful for virtual environments, preparing machines. And there's this very powerful best practice analyzer now. So clients today, they're like, well, I don't know if my AD is healthy. I don't know if it's following best practices. They fire up this best practice analyzer and it effectively goes through and does a scan of the environment. And it's like, well, do we have multiple domain controllers? Are they replicating correctly? Are there errors? And it basically gives us a, a stamp of health for our environment. So that, that, that's actually a, a big deal. Network access protection was a new feature in 2008 and essentially, long story short on this guy, it allows us to basically, for all our different types of access, be it physical connectivity to a server via 8021X, be it getting IP address from DHCP, securing using IPsec, before a machine can communicate with my resources, it has to prove to me it's a certain level of health. So before it can access anything, I, I can check, well, does it have its firewall enabled? Is it patched? Is it running antivirus and has good virus definitions? Third parties can hook into this and extend it. And effectively, only if a machine is healthy and meets our policies, will it be allowed to connect to our network. So today, a big issue is users come in, stick their computer into the socket in the wall, and they're accessing your network. With this technology, they can only do that if they're healthy and meet your criteria. If they're not healthy, we can stick them in a quarantine network and then make them healthy. We can deploy antivirus, make patch them, etc., etc. So this is a big deal for really keeping our network healthy. Obviously, Hyper-V. So this is the, the big virtualization platform. We had the first version as an add-on for 2008. Now in 2008 R2, it's there. It, it's a core role. We've got a number of new capabilities. We can support 32 logical processors, hot add remove of certain types of storage. And um, there's no dynamic memory, but the feature you really care about is live migration. So in 2008 Hyper-V, we had quick migration. And effectively what had to happen was when we wanted to move a virtual machine from one Hyper-V server to another, that virtual machine was basically put to sleep, its memory copied to disk, that disk was dismounted from one node, mounted on the other node, that memory read in, and then the virtual machine was started. It worked well, but it meant you had downtime. It could be 30 seconds, could be a minute. With live migration, there's now zero downtime. Effectively, what we're doing is we copy the memory of the virtual machine while the virtual machine is still running. Obviously, while we copy the virtual machine, the original memory changes slightly, um, and then it does another copy, so it does multiple passes of that memory copy. Each time it's only copying what's changed until that amount of memory is so small, it can basically just flip them over, pauses it for a split second, copies over the rest of the memory, copies over the contents of the CPU and the device registers, and then turns it on on the other side. So while there is a tiny pause, it's not noticed by the clients. It's well below the TCP connection timeout, which is the big deal. Our clients will connect in via TCP. As long as we pause for less than the TCP timeout, the client will never know we actually moved that box. And that's the same as VMware and anything else. There's always a slight pause, but the important thing is it's below the TCP connection timeout.